Hello, everybody. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you guys for being up and being here. This is just uh, me getting things prepared a little early. So to those that are already here attending, um, nice to see you. Hope everything's going well. We just have this last review session today for our um, intro to philosophy class. And then Tuesday, we're going to do our final exam. So we got a little bit more time today to go through study guide uh, as we were doing on Wednesday. Try to cover some more questions, and then um, then you guys will be off to your weekend, and hopefully a good successful week of uh, final exams next week. So get comfortable, um, you know, ready to go through the study guide. Hopefully you have a copy of it pulled up so that you can refer to it, and we'll take whatever questions in there that you guys want. Um, so yeah, that's the plan. Seems like it's all pretty clear cut. <clears throat> Long semester, so here we are finally at the tail end. Seems like, uh, I don't even know, like years ago that we were actually all in the classroom. Um, but hopefully that's just a, you know, a blip in the overall timeline of history as we return back to normal soon. <clears throat> cool, just in, you know, a couple minutes, four minutes, and then we'll definitely get going. <clears throat> Um, okay, Marissa, I see your question. Are you going to send us the prompts when we send them in? Uh, well, you took the midterm, right? Um, so it's the same type of deal. Uh, everyone's going to receive the test through a Blackboard announcement that I'll send at, at um, the test period start time. And then you just have to send me back an email response with your attached um, file containing your answers. So in this class, I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, that it's Tuesday from 8 to 10.30 a.m. Um, <clears throat> just double checking, but I'm almost certain. So basically, all you got to do is be ready to receive the document at that time um, on Tuesday. Complete your answers in the two and a half hour window that you got. And then just send it back to me. Yeah, so 8 to 10.30 on Tuesday. Um, I'm not sure what the alternative is that you're mentioning, though. Send us the prompts, and we send them in. Uh, first of all, what do you mean prompts? This is a test, so you're going to have a, a list of questions from the study guide. And then, uh, yeah, no, that's fine. No, it's no worries. But I just want to make sure everything's clear, because I hope I wasn't misleading and confused anybody. Um, we have our test on Tuesday morning. It's like a virtual, virtually proctored exam. So my philosophy of doing this class with the online transition is to try and make everything exactly identical to how I would have done it in a physical class meeting. So like in my mentality, I walk into the room at 10 or sorry, eight, I hand out the distribute the forms. They're returned back to me with answers before 1030. And then we all just go our separate ways. Um, since we don't have the classroom to do it, I send it to you through Blackboard, which is the mass delivery system for the class. And you're just going to send me back your reply. Um, of course, this means that you have total access to your notes and the book and everything. So you have a perfect chance to be really well prepared and get a decent score if you if you do what you are capable of. Uh, send them via email and then send them back via email. Well, that would be a maybe if they had like everyone's email address that they could just paste into the um, like who you're sending it to part of the email form. Um, but I don't have everybody's email um, off the top of my head. I mean, I could find it in the roster. But just going on Blackboard is the easiest way to send documents to everybody quickly. So I'll send you it through Blackboard, and you just email me to reply back. <clears throat> okay. Cool. So anybody that's watching, feel free to say hi. We gotta get started here in a few seconds. Um, it's good to know who's here and just all of that. So I'm sure. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, 
I'm sure that there could be a little bit less attendance today, just thinking about the probability because it's uh, late in the semester and some people probably feel that they got sufficiently detailed notes from the first part, but um, it's always to your benefit to study more rather than less. So you can never get too much of the information reviewed. Hi, Emily. Hi, Riley, Marissa, and everyone else. So yeah, um, you've got questions. Hey, Trevor, and I can help you uh, think about the answers. So please uh, let me know. Just go into the study guide. I'm not looking at it right now. Um, our test is Tuesday, 8 a.m. till 10.30 a.m., Tuesday, May 19th. So that is four days away. I'll, one other thing, I want to repeat this. Um, I'm working through the papers that you guys did submit on Monday, and I will finish them for sure this weekend. So when I'm done with them, probably tomorrow night or so, I'll send a big message to everybody saying the grades are done, and you can uh, email me if you'd like to see your score, to know your class grade, uh, or to see scanned images of any of the previous work including, of course, the recent essay. So anyway, that's just something that uh, will be finished this weekend, and you can know your grades um, uh, heading into that final exam session. <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, review is today. We've got 49 minutes left, so let's go. Um, whatever you want to talk about in the study guide, just let me know, and we'll, um, we'll try and get some good information um, on, on each question. Okay. Emily, why is it that according to the space-time theory, nothing changes? All right, any of you guys have a thought about that? Good, I see two of you both asking the same question. So um, who could say anything about that? Why is it that based on the space-time theory, nothing does change? If, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. If you could give me anything about that, like even just the faintest idea, then I could pick that up and add some comments and clarify. So just in general, why do you think that nothing uh, changes in the space-time theory of Einstein, which Ted Sider um, kind of latches onto? Nothing changes. Why not? <clears throat> just let's see if you can give me something. Okay. Um, no, Hugh. I mean, that's the opposite of what he says. The past and the future do exist. It, all the moments exist. But that's, I guess, a starting point to get us to the correct kind of answer. All the moments are all equally real. You may be in the habit of thinking that this is the present and nothing else is real except for now. But according to space-time theory, that is false because the past and the future are just as equally real as this moment right here. So Marissa, you're saying because the space-time theory states that the events which occur are like on a line and that everything occurs is supposed to happen as we move down that line. Well, you know, even that is, it's closer, but it's still a little off because when you say it's supposed to happen, that's stated in the future tense, like it hasn't happened yet. In the space-time theory, all the events all exist. There's no priority in terms of when they exist. So it's not like the future things are waiting to happen. The past things already happened, and the present things are happening now. Everything, every moment in the entire framework of time and space they're all just real, and they're all out there, as it were. So <clears throat> I'm tempted to say they all are real right now, but that would, to, that would be to introduce the temporal term now, which in a way is a misnomer according to this theory, because there's really no priority or unique aspect to the moment of now. They're all real. So look, um, but again, Trevor, when you say will happen, it's not that it will happen, it already has happened. It already exists. So if everything's real, then every event in time already exists. Let me give you an example. Suppose that today something bad happens to me and I, oops, you know, cutting up vegetables in the kitchen and I chop off this pinky. So at that point you'd say, wow, something changed about this man. He had 10 fingers yesterday, today he has nine. That's a change, right? But the space-time theory says it's actually no change because what really we see here in the space-time view is that I'm a set of temporal parts that are all stretched out on a timeline, okay? And so one of the temporal parts is a part that has 10 fingers. Adjacent to that, like the subsequent one in the timeline, there's a part that has nine. But those two parts sitting next to each other on the timeline 
they've always been at those two positions on the timeline. So the timeline overall hasn't changed. It includes one section where there's like nine finger temporal parts and another section where there's 10 finger temporal parts. But the overall structure of the entire sequence is unchanged. So like, here's another example to help you think about that. This is what Ted Sider uses in the paper to make this point. If you were driving down a road, and suppose that the beginning of the road is a very smooth and well-paved pavement. But then as you get further down that same like road, it's very bumpy with a lot of potholes. So it's like a rocky road now. Now, as you're driving, you might say, as you hit the bumps, wow, the road has changed. You know, it really has changed. Before it was smooth, now it's bumpy. But suppose that on day one, when the road was built, it already had these different features. Like the first stretch of it was smooth and a later stretch of it had a bunch of potholes. Is it really correct to say that the road overall has changed? No, it's just that there are different parts of it. One part of it doesn't have those bumps and another part does. Now, by analogy, in the space-time theory, you and me, people, or just anything, they're like the road. They're stretched out on a timeline full of temporal parts. So if there are some of your temporal parts, like in the future, that have gray hair, right, because uh, that's the older parts of you, you're not changing because the temporal part which has had the gray hair has always had it. And like the little baby temporal parts of you from your past that were like much smaller physically than you are now, you'd like to say, I grew, so I changed. But in this it, you know, explanation that we're giving, there's been no real change. The temporal part of you at this point in the timeline has always been this way. The temporal part of you earlier in the timeline has always been that way. So he says that instead of talking about real change, like one thing goes through changes, we have to re-describe re that as different temporal parts having different qualities. Um, so one temporal part having 10 fingers and another one in the same timeline having nine, that now is the sort of corollary to the ordinary concept of change. Okay, so that's the idea right there. Everything's laid out, so there's nothing that can change uh, because the moments that you think the things are changing into, they're already there. There you go. Okay, so what's next? <clears throat> yeah, so Emily, you talk about no human actions can change the outcome, and that's true too. Um, but just the idea of things going through changes is, is like an illusion on this theory. Okay, physicalism and idealism, Marissa's question. Who could just tell me anything about that? But we got to take it one at a time, so I'll go there, and then next after that, Riley, we can do your question. So first, Marissa, anybody here, physicalism versus idealism. These are two different views in the philosophy of mind. They're two different forms of monism. But they're different because one has one thing that it thinks everything's made of, and the other says something different. So with that, can you just add a few little points? What's physicalism and idealism, and what's the difference between them? You could give the definition, and you can justify how they're different. Yes, yeah, so physicalism says that everything is physical, including consciousness, so that everything's made out of matter. Everything in the universe is made out of physical material, basically atoms. That's right, so it's the monism about uh, physical matter. What's idealism then? <clears throat> idealism says that everything is made out of ideas, and it's all just mental stuff. Right, so everything's just perceptions and thoughts, but there's no real physical substance. Those are two different types of monism. The only thing they do have in common is that they agree that there's only one type of thing that makes everything, but they don't agree about what the one type of thing is. So in physicalism, the only substance is matter. And in idealism, the only substance is mind. Um, yeah, mind without physical brain. I guess in idealism, matter is just an illusion that we're thinking about as we think it. Um, but anyway, that's the difference. Everything is a uh, matter or everything's a thought. And those are the two options on the menu for people who are monists in, um, in the philosophy of mind. But, uh, but again, I think, which I mentioned this, most people uh, today anyway that are monists are much likelier to be a physicalist. The idealism is kind of like a relic at this point. Okay, so um, the other question above, I don't want to forget Riley, Einstein's example of the moving train. Okay. Um, yeah, so sorry, let me, let me get up the uh, study guide too, because, well, Ella, question 43, 
is this the precise wording of the question or is it, are you giving me a slightly reformulated um, statement of the question? Uh, Cause I'll have to pull it up really fast. <clears throat> Let's see. Okay, I've got it here. Oh, explain what it means for one proposition to entail another. Uh, so Ella, I'm a little confused. The number that you're reporting doesn't correspond in my notes here to the question I'm thinking of. But, but anyway, I'm going to still deal with 49 first. So let me go up above and deal with Riley's question. The moving train example of Einstein. Einstein has this example of two lightning strikes that happen on a railroad, basically. And he says, what if they're simultaneous? What does that actually mean? And he says, okay, well, let's get a very precise answer to that question. What it means for the two lightning strikes to be simultaneous is what? Well, that if we place an observer at the midpoint between the two, here's the midpoint, here's an observer, they're standing still at that midpoint. Now, if we assume that the speed of light is the same from every destination to every other, so it's constant, then that means that this is the same distance here. From A to M and from B to M is the same amount of space and distance. So if these two light rays are moving at the speed of light, right, um, which in Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, C is the constant, which stands for the speed of light. So this velocity from A to M, the beam of light, is traveling at that value of C, which is 186,000 miles per second. So there's the same distance from A to M and B to M. If they both reach M at the same point, which is what he observes, then given the fact that they travel the same distance over the same velocity, means that they must have left from their original points A and B at the same time, which is simultaneity. But we have to then consider the condition of a secondary observer who's also on the scene. The second observer is in this train. The train is traveling from left to right with velocity B. It will surpass the midpoint M. As seen from the moving train, let us designate it as M prime to distinguish it from his standing position. As he passes through the plane of M prime, he will conduct an observation of the two lightning strikes. And that moment that he starts to conduct the observation is the same moment where this man sees the two things happening simultaneously from M. But because he's being carried to the right with the constant velocity V, as he surpasses the midpoint, this means that the beam of light, which is projected from B, has a shorter distance to reach his eye because he's closer than halfway past the midpoint. But the beam of light, which is emitted from A, has a longer distance to travel to reach him since he's running away from it. He's not at rest. He's in motion. So he's going towards the right. He's going towards the beam of light given off by position B. So obviously, the two beams of light have different distances to travel moving at the same speed. Therefore, one of them will get there faster, the one that has the shorter distance to travel at the same speed. So he's going to receive the light ray from B before the one from A can catch up to his visual system, his eye. Therefore, B and A are not simultaneous to the second observer who's on the train, unlike the first observer who's standing still at the midpoint. And therefore, the concept of simultaneous is relative. There's no objective fact as to whether A and B are simultaneous. From one particular observer's position, they are. From another particular observer's position, they are not. And therefore, the events and the order which they occur in do not have an objective linear sequence. And that's the sort of deep and troubling, I don't know, trippy element of this whole thing. It would imply, as we've talked about many times, that all the moments of space-time have equal reality. Because those that you would say are in the future could have a different order according to a different possible observer's position in space. Okay? So the moving train example is about relativity. It's about two lightning strikes being simultaneous to one observer and not to another. So you would have to basically give the facts and details about how this experiment for simultaneity in which two observers report different uh, conclusions, how that would go in the same way that we've described it here. Okay, so I'm going down a little further to Ella. Um, <clears throat> I'm just confused about that. I still want to know what you mean by 43, because 43, here's what it says in my notes. It says, explain what it means for one proposition to entail another. So uh, 
you have to get back to me on that because I, I can't interpret the question as you wrote it, at least not for now. But Emily there below. Um, explain Stoljar's distinction between the completeness and the truth question. On Wednesday, I think I told everybody I'm not asking that question because it's been, it's not the question that I intended to ask. Um, yeah, so don't worry about 62. To those here on Wednesday, I mentioned that, that it's, it's a question that I intended to ask differently. The way that I had hoped to word it was, distinction between the interpretation question and the truth question. The completeness question is like a subcategory of the interpretation question. And in my lecture to you, I decided for the sake of brevity and clarity to skip over that one detail. So it was a question that I included in the list, but without the proper discussion in the lecture, I didn't want to actually ask it. So not to worry about 62. Um, now here, the, the Lost Island, that's a good question, Hugh. Yes, it's an old one now at this point. So Lost Island is an easy one, I think. So Saint Anselm, um, the, the famous Archbishop of Canterbury, who was later canonized as a saint in the, uh, in the Christian church, he wrote the ontological argument in his book, The Proslogion, a thousand years ago, way back in 1077. The argument, so I'm giving you context. First of all, I'm telling you what the ontological argument is because Gamilo is a critic of it. Um, he's a person saying that he didn't like or agree with the argument. So for you to understand how he responds to it, I'm going to say the argument first, which is also, I guess, good enough review for you. Ontological argument. God, everyone he says knows, is at least the definition, is the greatest conceivable being. And if you're the greatest conceivable being by definition, then you have to exist, because if you didn't, that would be less perfect and less great. So the greatest conceivable being can't lack for anything, can't lack for greatness. But existing is better than not existing. Like so, to exist in both the mind and in reality is greater than just existing in the mind. So he exists in both, which means he's real. But now we've got Gamilo, who's critical of that. So Gamilo's criticism is all this point that you can think of a thing that's the greatest conceivable so and so, but it still doesn't necessarily have to really exist. The lost island is his attempt to create a counterexample to Anselm's reasoning. So what did he say the Lost Island was? Can anybody just tell me that? The Lost Island, he says, imagine that there's an island, I'll call it the Lost Island, and it's, by, it's like this. What's it like? What's the basic description of it? It's supposed to be what kind of island, this Lost Island? Go back in your memory. A perfect island, yeah. The greatest conceivable island, exactly, yeah. So we've defined it. It's in the head, it's in the mind, I'm thinking about it, you're thinking about it. And so what he's saying is, uh, if um, Anselm is correct, that the greatest conceivable being must actually be real in order to, to meet that standard of being greatest, then this like created out of like nothing concept of the lost island, the greatest conceivable island, that it must be real, because if it wasn't actually real in reality, then it would lack for greatness, and it wouldn't be the way it's defined. But obviously, the point that Gamilo wants us to understand is that there is no such island at all, no matter whether or not we've made up the concept of it uh, as greatest. So the same could be said to Anselm. Your definition of God is greatest conceivable being, but that doesn't answer all and settle all the doubts as to whether there's actually any such thing as that. Um, if you could prove that a thing existed just by having an idea of it being the greatest, then I guess by the same logic, we would have this proof that the island exists. But he's, he's saying that's ridiculous and absurd. So we should be skeptical of the argument too. Okay, so that's good. Now above, um, but the wording of the question is the same. Uh, well, I just don't know though. There's no question that has that wording though. Um, uh, what question shall I um, answer if you have it there, Ella? And then I can look at the information, but um, just help me understand what question you have for me. Then I can talk about it. Just write the question out. Yeah, that question's from the essay prompts, but it's also not in the essay prompts. I mean, in the essay prompt, the wording isn't that way either. The essay prompt says, Explain the classical account of knowledge and how each condition is separately necessary but jointly sufficient. Then explain how Gettier showed that the classical account 
is false? And which view did you think was better? But only in like comments maybe that I wrote to you in a personal email did I say give examples of what counts as satisfying two but not three. That would be in reply to a request for comments because um, some students that wrote that essay who gave me drafts didn't give a detailed enough description of uh, how it is that the knowledge fails when any of the conditions are not met. But anyway, yeah, so just, uh, no, it's okay, but I want you to have the correct study guide though. So like go back to your emails, L type in Vulich 101 in the search bar, find the original message delivered, and then print it or view it again, because you'll be off. If you're looking at the wrong questions, you won't be studying the right material, and you gotta correct that, because your test is important, right? So you gotta be looking at the actual number list. Anybody in the class can send it to Ella or Ella, you should be able to find it too. Okay, so let me go back up there. Uh, 62, Emily. Stoll jars, okay, but we, we talked about that. Okay, Gamilo's Lost Island, moving on. Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so I'm just waiting for the next question from you guys. Therefore, Emily, you have 27, both versions of the categorical imperative. Oh, and Riley, you are still asking about entailment. So yes, we'll talk about that too. But let me do Emily's for now. Categorical imperative, okay, so Kant is the famous German philosopher of ethics who said that if you want to do the right thing, you have to obey the moral law. And you have to do that because it's your duty to do it, not because it's going to make everybody happy or because it's going to create the most happiness, just because it's your duty to do it, and you have to do your duty. But what is the moral law? He says, well, reason can discover the moral law by applying this principle called the categorical imperative to your behavior. There are two versions of the categorical imperative. So who in this uh, meeting could give me any detail about the versions that I'm speaking of? They tell you like how you should never act or how you should always act. So what do they say? The first one has to do with, hint, the term maxim. And the second one has to do with the concept of means and ends. So what do they say? Give me a little bit of feedback and then I'll take you from there. <clears throat> so Kant's categorical imperative, two principles. So the second one, treat others as an end, never as a means to an end. That's right. And then the first one, act as if it would be, a, well, uh, the wording of it, Marissa, is a little off, but that's sort of in the right ballpark. You, isn't it something like only do something if at the same time you would make it a universal law? That's a little better, yeah. So. Um, Correct, so the first version, let me do it starting with the first and moving to the second. The first one's the one about universal laws and maxims. It says, act always so that the maxim which describes your action could be willed to be a universal law. Um, so only do actions that would be possible for everybody to do and that would not be undesirable if everybody did them. If you, let's say, take a free ride on the subway um, and don't pay the fare, that does not work if every single person does the same. Because if everyone did that, then there would no longer be anybody paying the fare. And so it would not have adequate funding to operate. Um, if you request a loan with no intention to repay it, but you make a false promise to repay it, that does not work if everybody did the same thing. Because if 100% of borrowers lied to the lender, then the lenders would stop lending and the borrower who wants to lie would not even have the ability to be believed when they lie. So it's only okay to do actions that would be possible for everyone to do. If you want to cut in line, of course you don't want everybody else to also cut because what would be the point? Then as soon as you cut, you would be recut by all the others. Um, and by the way, no line could even exist if every 100% of persons in the line cut it. Um, so anyway, one version of the categorical imperative says it's not morally permitted to do an action that cannot be made universal. The second one says do ne never treat a human being as a means to an end. Now an end is a goal and a means is whatever you're doing to get to that goal. So like if you have a goal in your life of getting a degree, then this class I guess is one means to that end. But people though, people themselves, human beings are not supposed to be treated like tools or instruments to use to get to your goals. So like, I don't know, if you have a friend just because um, they're going to 
spend money on you or something, uh, then you're using them as a means to that end. And that's not okay because they're a human being and not like a voucher for you. Um, if a person rapes somebody, a horrifying act, but then in that case, of course, they're using the person as a means to whatever desired uh, pleasure they would get from the act, as, as bizarre as that is to even consider that people would do that. So you're not okay to use people as a means. You have to treat people like they are a goal, not something that you use to get what you want. Okay, so those are the two versions of the categorical imperative. Number one, only act on maxims that could be universal laws. Give an example. Number two, never treat a human being as a means to an end. And you can give an example of that. I think I talked about like something really out there, like if a person used someone else as like, I don't know, a human shield. Uh, but you can imagine any different kind of exploitation or manipulation of a person in the pursuit of a goal that you have. And that's always wrong, according to Kant. Um, Onora O'Neill, little added point on this. She said that you treat a person as a means when you involve them in an interaction that they would not consent to. So um, I think another question on the list that that same type of area talks about what does it mean, according to O'Neill, to treat a person as a means? And that would be her um, reasoning on it. Okay, so uh, what's next then? Hugh, number 29, um, an action that's morally obligatory based on one theory but wrong according to another one. So yes, tell me, uh, what would that be? You have to give an action here. So you have to just come up with something that one theory would say you have to do that and the other would say you cannot do that. So just what could be an example like of that kind? And basically the two theories that we have are like, uh, oh, right, we had one above, sorry. Oh, the entailment, yeah, I'll, I keep forgetting. I'll, I'll do entailment then for sure. Uh, but. But let me just finish this one here. Um, give me some type of action, though. You know, a case, an example, a scenario where if a person did that, one ethical theory would say, you may not do that. That is wrong. And the other one would say, you have to do that, and that's an obligation. So I'm just trying to see for you to point out a case where the two theories would divide. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, what could it be? Just give me some type of action. So the case involving the doctor of the organs, yeah, uh, that, that would work. Um, and stealing somebody to feed your family, that could also work. So let me give both of those cases. Going to help someone after a car accident that you passed on the road. Well, Trevor, I don't know about that one actually because that case just shows differences between utilitarianism and Kantianism. But the Kantian doesn't say you're obligated to help the person. They just say that it's permissible. Uh, so let me go with the other two, which are good examples from Matthew there and Hugh. Uh, starting with the transplant case. So in this weird transplant scenario, you got to imagine like there's five people that are sick that want organ transplants to survive. And there's one healthy person that has all the organs, but you know, there's nothing wrong with them. So imagine if a doctor or some person committed murder to kill the one and used all their organs to save the other five. Now, would that be okay? Well, it depends on the theory. Uh, to a Kantian, no, it's not okay because as we just said, that would treat the one person as a means to an end. I mean, literally, their, their body parts are used as a means to what end? To the end, to the goal of saving other people's lives. But a human being is not just a source of spare parts. Otherwise, you know, you could just go and find homeless people and swap out their organs for like dying, wealthy and productive people. And you could just say, oh, well, there's more utility in that. But, but that's inhumane and that's a violation of their human rights, according to many people's way of thinking. So Kant would say that's never to be done because of treating the person as a means and a person is to be treated as an end. But to a utilitarian, um, it's at least something to consider, I guess, because they would say, well, the alternative is that five people will die and one person that is spared lives. But if they are killed, then they die, but five live. So if we have that outcome, it's a net increase of total survival and therefore a greater amount of total happiness that can be the product of that going forward. So basically, a case like that would be one where, yeah, a utilitarian might say you should, and a Kantian would say no. You gave another example, Hugh, stealing to feed a family. Yeah, so say that you wanted to steal to feed like a poor family. You stole something from a wealthy uh, person. That would be treating the wealthy person and their wealth as a means to the goal you have set of assisting other people. But the wealthy person is not a means to that end. They're supposed to be treated as a goal and not as an instrument. Um, but to the utilitarian way of thinking, if the loss of utility to the wealthy person from the loss of the stolen item 
is overcompensated for by the gain in utility to the recipient of the stolen item, then they would say that that's more utility than if you didn't steal. So you should actually do the theft. So that's another fair example. The only other kind of case I guess I would like maybe mention is you can also have one that goes in the opposite direction where, where the uh, Kantian would say you have to do it and the utilitarian would say, no, you should not. And so Kant basically would always say you have to tell the truth in every situation because you can never universalize the maxim that says lie when it's in your best interests. So um, if you could dream up a situation where lying would cause a terrible consequence, then that would be a case where Kant would say, but it's your duty to tell the truth. And the utilitarian would say, you better not tell the truth here because it's going to produce negative results. So that's another kind of case you could give. And there's more besides, but those are, I think, some decent, fair examples there. Okay, so now back to entailment, uh, Riley. Um, what does it mean for one proposition to entail another? Can you give me any idea of that? So suppose I've labeled two propositions A and B, and I'm telling you that A entails B. So what's the relationship between A and B in that case? If A entails B, what does this mean about A and B specifically? So just let me hear that. If a proposition or statement entails another one, what's the link between the two? Little hint, it has to do with the word true. Good, okay, Hugh. If A is true, then B must be true as well. I'm gonna give you two statements, and let's see if you can tell me whether they, uh, which one entails the other. Okay, so the Smith-Jones example with the job is one illustration of how entailment could work. But it's something that we do every day all the time, logically. Um, yeah, the information given in A confirms the statement of B. So here are two statements. I am in the United States. And another one, I am in California. Now, which one entails the other one? Let's see if you could give me that. Two statements. One statement is, I'm in the United States. The other statement is, I am in California. Which one of those entails the other? Okay, good. Being in California does entail that I'm in the United States. Absolutely. Because if it's true that I'm in California, and I actually am, then I have to be in the United States because just physically, it's a sub part of the United States. So every part of California is a part of the US. But do you understand that the other way around doesn't entail? If I told you that I'm in the United States, does that entail that I'm in California? No, because there are 49 other states. So being in the US doesn't, doesn't require or mandate or like logically imply that a person's in one state, but being in one state does imply that they're in the country of which that state is a part, okay? So that's how entailment works. It's, all, it's about like deducing one thing from another. If I told you that I was in California, you could deduce that I was in the United States because that second statement follows from the first. And since you have justification for believing the first, that justification transmits over to the second proposition too. So like, I don't know, if I could somehow give you evidence right now that I'm in California, aside from me just telling you, which I think is good evidence enough, then you could say you're justified in believing that this professor is in California right now. And then if you just think logically about it, you'd be like, well, it therefore follows that he's in the US because that entails that. Then you'd also have evidence for believing the second thing because it's a logical byproduct of the first. Um, I was born in the 1980s. That entails, among other things, that I'm older than 20 because I could not have been born in the 80s and still be alive today and be at some age that's less than 20 or even 30. Uh, so yeah, um, that's the basic idea there, entailment. It's a logical relationship that holds between two propositions when the first one being true guarantees that the second one is true as well. Um, so if I have like two bananas and two apples in my lunch, that entails that I have at least two fruits in the bag, you know? Um, but there's a lot of examples. There's infinitely many examples of entailment. We do it all the time. If I say, um, I don't know, like, like sometimes we reason like this. You're looking for something that's lost and um, you say to yourself, well, I know that it's somewhere in my house. Um, and therefore, I know that I don't have to look for it outside, right? Because if it's somewhere in the house, then it's true that it's not outside. Um, so, you know, entailment is something that we think about and do, but a lot of times we do it subconsciously. Okay, cool. So what's the other one next? Um, 
Descartes' argument about dualism, that the mind and the body are distinct. Okay, so that's a pretty uh, detailed argument, but um, anyone that can just tell me at least a couple of basic points within it. Um, you know, like, you don't have to run down the whole thing, obviously, but if you could say anything about it that is like part of the core of the argument, why does Descartes think that the mind and the body are not just the same thing? Why does he say they're two different separate things? What, what was the reason for that? Mind and the body being separate. So mind, no extension, it's just thinking, it's like a soul, but the body is made out of matter and it's extended. Um, so let's try and understand that really fast. The dualist argument of Descartes. It's got a lot of premises, but for now anyway, for our review, I just kind of want you to tell me a, a little bit of it, about it and then I can fill in the gaps. Um, okay, so Hugh, because he can imagine them separate, and he can trust his perceptions because God wouldn't deceive him. Very good. Yeah, that really gets to the basic core. Uh, <clears throat> so, and Trevor, you're saying they're both separate because we can comprehend things to be apart. Yes, also correct. That's all true. So what he said was um, he's looking for certainty in his book, The Meditations, and he uses a method of doubt to try and find certainty. The method of doubt says to just consider something false if there's any way that it could be false. And with that method of doubt, almost everything can be set aside as false, including everything you perceive with your five senses, even math and logic, because we are not 100% certain whether we're dreaming or not, or whether we're being manipulated by some like deceiver, like a demon. So once we see the method of doubt being used, the one and only thing that kind of at, at first survives the method of doubt is the knowledge of your own existence, because you are thinking. And the fact that you're thinking just proves that you exist. Even if maybe your body is just an illusion, if nothing else, you're a mind having thoughts. So you know you exist because you're thinking. I think therefore I am. From there, there's a couple more steps. So you know you exist, and in your mind is the idea of God, among other things. But the idea of God, he singles that out because he says that's the idea of something infinite and perfect. So whatever caused that idea has to also be infinite, and that means there must really be a God. So since God exists and he is not evil and he's a perfectly good being, that means he would never deceive you. So when you have a clear and distinct perception, you can trust that it's true because God wouldn't let you have those and still have them be false. So one clear and distinct perception is that if you can imagine two things existing separate from each other, then even if they're close or attached to each other for now, the fact that you can imagine them being separated means that they actually are two separate things. Like, I, you know, me and these glasses, uh, they're on my head for now, but clearly they don't have to be. And since it's obvious to be able to think of them being removed, they really can be, okay? Now, the last step is that you can clearly conceive of the mind and the body existing separately, which was already demonstrated by the method of doubt, which says that the existence of the body itself may not even be real. So you can clearly conceive of the mind and the body existing separately, and since when two things can be understood existing separately, that means they are separate. It thus follows conclusion that the mind and the body are really two separate things. So that's like the long version of it, but just a quick recap, just sort of crash course bullet points on it. You can imagine your mind and body existing separately, so they really are separate. And that is backed up and guaranteed by the fact that God is real and he wouldn't let you have clear and distinct perceptions that were false. Okay, so Good. Um, and you're saying here, a lot of it hinges on God's existence. Totally a side note. I'm curious, is there another dualist argument that doesn't have the dependency of God? Um, well, there's very sophisticated versions of um, like epiphenomenalism in contemporary dualist metaphysics. Um, one way of looking at it, some people say... Um, that it cannot be entirely like a physical computing system, the way that consciousness works. Um, it can't just be like um, a purely physical process. So there's this, it's a weird um, name of an argument, but I believe Thomas Nagel wrote a paper, or, or is it Searle? It's one of these two authors, Searle or Nagel, um, the Chinese room. They talk about how a machine um, or even a person who simply gets input signals which trigger 
output conditions to like spit out parts of speech, basically a language translator would not actually understand the language if all they were doing was shuffling bits of information. So that's his argument that like a computing system would never actually achieve consciousness because all it's doing is sorting through data and not really thinking about it. And some people argue that that means that consciousness is something that cannot be entirely located in a physical basis because a physical basis can only manipulate input and output conditions. Another argument that I've heard is this. Um, yeah, these people would say Turing is wrong for sure. Another argument that I've heard is this. Um, so it's the, um, like a woman is in a room and she has not ever seen the color red. Um, and so people try to describe red to her and they like, she just reads information about it. She reads about the electromagnetic wavelength and the spectrum of light. And she learns that red is like a greater intensity of color saturation on that spectrum, but she never actually has seen the color. Right. And so this is a weird argument, but the idea is that when she steps out of the room and sees red for the first time, there's no way that she could have understood it or experienced it just by thinking about it in its physical description. So some people say that's kind of how consciousness is like, it can't just be um, this functionalist system, which takes inputs and gives outputs because otherwise you could functionally describe the qualitative aspect of, of having a, a taste or seeing a color. But there's something experiential about that that is never going to be capable of comprehension just based on a formal analysis of it. This is another attempt to say that there's something about consciousness that is so rich and so experiential that it cannot be reduced to functional states of the brain. Functional states of the brain operate in a way much similar to computer um, circuits. Um, some people think that there's an element of the experience and the subjective quality of it that is forever missing from a purely physical description of it. So like, you know, if everything was just physical, you wouldn't actually have feelings or something. Um, you'd be like a computer. That's a weird argument. I don't know. It has definitely got some appeal. Another version of it in a, this book, if you ever want to look at it, is the article by Nagel called What It's Like to Be a Bat. Um, he says, try your hardest to imagine what it's like to be a bat, and you'll never be able to comprehend that. Um, because your existence as a human consciousness can't possibly fathom or grasp the internal perspective of bats that see with sonar and echolocation and stuff like that. Um, therefore, consciousness can't be merely the byproduct of a physical system because physical systems can be perfectly described and you can understand them, but there's a conscious aspect, a subjective perspective element of consciousness that is not ever going to be revealed by physical description. So, I mean, that's, that's the sort of stuff that modern day dualists do discuss. Um, you know, I, I could have included a little more of that material, I guess, but the Cartesian arguments considered the classic, and I figured let's get you into the classic stuff, and then if you ever find interest in it, you can you can zoom into looking at some of the newer things. Okay, so Ella, does this question have proper numbering? Explain the objection. Yes, that is correct. And then Riley, you ask the subsequent question. What's the reply? Okay, so um, the question you're asking is about JJC Smart's essay, and um, <clears throat> He basically said, look, physicalism is true. There's no dualism. There's just, you just got a brain and the brain is the whole thing that creates consciousness. There's no spiritual aspect to it. There's no soul. There's just the brain and it's got neuro, neurological function. Um, now he says, let me, let me take on the best critics. Let me take on the best objections and I'll just, I'll bat them out of the park, right? So the first objection that he hears or that he thinks of is that one you're talking about Ella in question 66. A man may know nothing about brain processes. That's what the objection says. Oh yeah, no, thank you very much, uh, Trevor, for that. So, a man may know nothing about brain processes, but he can talk about his experiences. So they must not be the same. All right, so like think back to the last film that you watched or something. Uh, and imagine, you know, the feelings and experiences you had while you watched it. Was it funny? Was it boring? Was it uh, scary? You know, did it make you excited or whatever? So you had that film experience, the film going experience. Of course, now I guess what, we can't go to the theater, but you know, probably watching some good movies at home. Anyway, um, so tell me though what was going on in your brain. Because what JJC Smart says is that all your experiences and sensations, they're really just brain processes. 
Now his critic would say, no, they're not the same thing because we can't talk about them easily in the same way. Talking about your experiences is, is pretty basic. Everyone does that. But talking about your brain processes is like a mystery. You don't really know what's going on in there. So how could they be the same? Which is what JJC Smart is claiming. So that's the objection. Don't tell me the brain and the sensation are the same because we, I can't even tell you what's going on in my brain. But I can certainly tell you everything about what I'm experiencing just like an everyday person could do. Okay, that's one objection. It's an objection against JJC Smart coming from some dualist point of view. His reply back to that, which Riley is your question, is this. Just because there are two words or two descriptions for something does not necessarily mean that it has to be two different things. And he gave an example of the morning and the evening star. So in real life, at one point in previous past history, people looking at the night sky and the morning sky saw this bright object and they thought that there were two different stars. So one they call the evening star, one they call the morning star. But in fact, there were not two different stars. There was just one thing which had gotten two labels. So what JJC Smart says in response to all that is that the brain process and the sensation are kind of like just two words for one thing again, like the morning and the evening star. Even though there are two words and maybe even two different ways that the thing is described, that doesn't necessarily imply that it has to be two different things. That doesn't entail that there have to be two things. As we see with the morning and the evening star example, there can certainly be cases where two distinct terms or descriptions refer to one and the same thing. And so he would say, that's, that's what language is doing. It's causing you to think that your brain process is not a sensation because when we talk about the brain process, we don't usually talk at all about the subjective quality of an experience and vice versa. When you talk about like the flavor of a meal, you don't talk at all about the brain, but that's just a linguistic distinction. In physical reality, it's the same thing. Okay. Now, Hugh, your question is about the ship owner situation of W.K. Clifford. Uh, he said that it's always wrong to believe anything, anytime, without good enough evidence. Um, and so if you do that, you're doing something bad. And um, the ship owner situation is an example that he gives to make the point. He basically said in the case, imagine that a person knows that he has a really damaged ship He's the owner, and um, he knows that it's likely to sink if it goes anywhere. But he really hopes and wishes that it would be able to successfully take one more journey because maybe he can make money off of that last journey. So though he knows how sad, uh, how dangerous the ship is, um, and he's going to go with his hope instead of the evidence. So he lets it sail. And one way that that could play out is that the ship does sink. And if it does, of course he did something wrong because he knew that it could and he had the evidence, but he ignored it. On the other hand, even if it doesn't sink, he says that was still wrong though, because even if let's say the bad results don't happen, just allowing those risks to be taken is, is still wrong. And it easily could have played out unfavorably, you know? So like, I don't know if a person in this social distancing world or whatever, like says, well, uh, if, if I, if I go to this one highly populated area, there's a chance that I could get sick uh, from the virus. But I hope that doesn't happen because I really want to go to that area. So even though the evidence shows that this is a dangerous thing to do, I'm gonna go with what I hope and wish instead of the evidence. And if they did that, they might get sick. And of course, then they'd be like, damn, I, you know, that was a dumb thing and I should have gone with the evidence. But if they get lucky and nothing happens, you could argue that it was still a wrong thing, right? Because the risk was taken and it added additional likelihood that someone might get harmed. So, you know, Clifford's ship owner example is just that kind of example where taking a risk in full view of the evidence that it's going to probably not play out well is a bad thing to do. And so you got to go with evidence. You're not supposed to just go with hope, things you hope. And that can play back into criticisms of um, arguments for the existence of God. Um, like Pascal's wager, for example. You shouldn't be believing in God just because you hope it's true. And if it is, that would be to your best interest. It should be based on the evidence that it's true. Um, so that's like one possible objection to Pascal, to Clifford. You could use that too. And so last thing, Riley, I know we're right here at the end. Bad faith, simple enough. That's when you try to blame other people or other things for uh, the way you are. Okay, so your essence is something that you're creating and you've got total control over it. Your identity, your character, the way that you are as a person, your temperament, your 
interests, your preferences, your beliefs, that's all on you. And when you try and say, no, it's really not, it's because of my parents or wait, maybe it's because of the school I went to, or maybe it's because of the frat or the sorority, or maybe it's because of, you know, the job that I worked or the time period I grew up in. Maybe it was the cultural region that I grew up in. None of that is true. According to existentialist thought, that's bad faith even saying that. So bad faith is when you try to avoid the personal responsibility for how you are by putting it on things uh, that you couldn't control. Could it link to the credulous character? Uh, I don't know. Um, I could sort of see something in the ballpark of a connection. But the credulous character is just a person who gives credibility to things that they really shouldn't. And the bad faith person is not necessarily giving credence to things that they should not, but rather saying things that they know deep down are not really true. So it's kind of like being disingenuous more than being credulous. Um, you know, thinking, understanding within that you're the person who's um, the author of your own being, but yet um, trying to withdraw from the accountability for that um, in this way of bad faith. So it's, there's some kind of similarity in the sense of like not doing what you're supposed to do, uh, but there's a different basis for the two descriptions, I think. Okay, so good review session, guys. I, I really do appreciate everything, and you've, you've stuck with it to the end, so it's been a great class. Uh, have a good final on Tuesday. I'll be in touch with you over the weekend for the um, report of your grades for the last essay, and, uh, and that should be it. Um, have a great one. Uh, I look forward to seeing you guys around campus if we can open up in the fall, or if not, then hopefully in the spring at, at least. Um, so be in touch. Um, and stay safe, and I will definitely see you guys around. It's sad that it's our last class, but uh, you guys are just getting started in life, so you got a lot to look forward to. But anyway, um, thanks again, and I'll definitely be in touch. All right, bye-bye. Thank you. <clears throat>